Hey, good evening, everyone. Hi. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen this room so full. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. I literally can express how thrilled I am to welcome you to this SAG After Foundation conversation with actor, producer, singer, superhero Hugh Jackman. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an actor who can literally play any genre in any medium. Along the way, he has, of course, picked up a Golden Globe Award, a Tony Award, an Emmy Award, an Academy Award nomination, and two SAG Award nominations. Um, he is, of course, <laughs> sure. <laughs> He is, of course, he's Jean Valjean. He's Wolverine. He is literally and figuratively the greatest showman. Please welcome Hugh Jackman. Hi, hey guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Of course. Thanks. Oh, this is great. I love it. How are you guys? Thank you. So, by the way, you were Thank kind you of. That. Of course, yeah. This Good is also trust. my dad's favorite actor. This is the only actor we ever. Really? Heard. Have I never told you? My dad loved you, but he never got your name right. He <laughs> what, what, what was it? Stu Jackson. Stu. <laughs> <laughs> For Much like. Better name. Yeah, for 14 years, Stu he would always Jackson. be like. What's that guy in Kate and Leopold doing? <laughs> really? And I'm like, you love that guy. His name is Hugh Jackman. Like, please learn no, it. No, I'm going Stu. <laughs> Stu Jackson. Well, I told you this years yeah. ago, and you actually said, you mm. said, in your father's defense, Hugh Jackman is a dumb name. I struggled. <laughs> this is a weird thing. I love My, this name. I couldn't pronounce the name Hugh till I was six. You're kidding. And I used to say Sue. <laughs> Apparently, my mom says, there was, oh, you're a lovely little girl, and I used to kick people in the shins. So I was, but Hugh is like, if you go to Europe, there's no word starts with the H, it's Hugo, or in France, it's Hugh. Really? They can't say Hugh either. And in New York, no one can say Hugh. You! You! <laughs> you! I, I think people are yelling at me, they're being affectionate. You! <laughs> I it's think it's a name. great name. I like it. I've come to appreciate it. You've come to appreciate it. it. I mean, did you ever think of changing it? Never. Okay, no, good. No. <laughs> I don't like filling out forms. <laughs> uh, this is an audience of SAG actors. Oh, it's and terrific. Yes. It's great to, be, great to be with you all, really. So I always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? And I think I know the answer to this one. Yeah, Wolverine. It was X-Men. Yeah, it was X-Men. Wow. Yeah, so I was in uh, London doing Oklahoma Woo. on the West End, and i never forget the audition I had for it. It was a worldwide casting call, uh, and I, I was sent three pages, right? You know, even back then, they were secretive with the superhero scripts. And I, I never forget, I was, my wife's an actor too, so proud SAG member. And she, uh, she reads, you know, I run all my lines with her, obviously, for auditions. And so I was going through it and she goes, I never, she goes, uh, okay, Wolverine senses danger, his nostrils flare. She was like, oh. <laughs> it said his nostrils flare. And he goes, and then she goes, I never forget, she goes, snicked, S-N-I-K-T. Claws come out of his hand. She goes, Hugh, you can't be doing this. this is <laughs> She never heard of X-Men, obviously, and she goes, you can't, you're at the Royal National Theatre with Sir Trevor Nunn, you can't be having claws coming out of your hands. And I said, uh, look, I'm going to audition, of course I'm going to audition. She goes, well, you're on your own. So I went the next day for the audition, and it was in between the matinee and the evening show. So, and, and it was about a three hour show of Oklahoma. I had, the, I literally ran off stage, I whip off the leather like chaps, and I just run into Soho in London to do this audition. And I was playing curly. I had a perm in my hair. <laughs> so I had a baseball cap on. And the casting agent goes, uh, you may want to remove the baseball cap. And I was like, I don't think so. And she said, <laughs> she goes, no, you really should. And I took it off. She goes, yeah, you can put that back on. <laughs> and, and I got a callback. I was, I was wow. an absolute, but I remember the callback instructions were, maybe next time you could lose the perm. <laughs> And, and lose the Southern cowboy accent. Because oh, I was, no. I was yeah. Australian, I was doing my first American accent. It was, a, I was playing Oklahoma, so I, it must be a very embarrassing tape. That oh, I hope it's somewhere. Show. But anyway, that's what, that was the longest story. That's what got me my sad cut. Wow. That, you know, that job. 
Most people sit here and say like a Burger King commercial, but <laughs> yeah. yours was the first of nine right. giant movies yeah. in a franchise. No, and I did about seven auditions for that. It was about a nine-month process. Uh, Dugray Scott had the part, so I was in the early running, and then Dugray Scott got it, and then I was out, and then I was back. But it was about a literally about a seven. Yeah. Anyway, it's the only time my wife has ever been wrong. By the way, I was just, I just gonna say, yeah. Yeah. I see those cameras. Please, God, I hope she doesn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to know the onomatopoeia for the Wolverine closet. It's snicked. snicked. That's so cool. You put in an extra one. You put a like a S C. Did it's I? S N I K T. Snicked. Yeah, but no, I yeah. like oh, schnicked. The schnicked is good. S N I K T. But um, so I do want to go back and start at the beginning because, as people probably have guessed, you're not from America. Right. Um, you were born in Sydney, and I mean, I can't think of any place that's further away from Hollywood. When did you first start thinking you wanted to be an actor? Um, wow, I, I got to it late. I think I was I, I was doing it all along from when I was five. I was in amateur musicals, I was in amateur plays, I did them at school, but it was in my final year of college, so I, I, had a, I did a communications degree majoring in journalism, and in the very last semester, I was two units short of my 24 that I had to do to graduate. So someone said, you gotta do the drama class, it's easy, you just turn up, there's nothing, and I was like, oh, all right, uh, yeah, okay. So I turned up on the last possible day to qualify for the unit, so on the fourth, week is when I turned up and he decided to do a play this guy for the first time in 10 years and I got cast in the lead by just seek the ballot like he was literally really? drawing a line across the class list to the cast right and I got the lead and I begged I said mate I'm in my final thing I've got like theses I'm doing everything and I can't do this and he goes well then you're out I said no but if I'm out I can't graduate I need and he goes well then you're the lead and I was like oh <laughs> so he must have been thrilled at yeah, that point, yeah. <laughs> knowing his lead was begging to get out. And I spent 90% of my time on that. And that's yeah. and, and I'll never forget it. We ended up touring with it to, that's making it sound far grander than it was, but we went to another college that was doing the same course that I was doing, but the other half of the course was acting. And we were being uh, billeted. We were staying with other students. And you know that feeling where you, I walked into the house, there were six or seven people living in this house, and I was like... I've just I've just wasted the last three years of my life. Mm, mm -hmm. I was like, I, these are my people. I, you just know, like you just know, this is my tribe. And so that that was it. I was 23 mm. at the time, 22, 23, and I was like, I think I want to go off and do acting. And so uh, I went off and studied for four years and um, and loved every single second of it. And it's really, I'm one of those people. I spent seven years at tertiary, like. Education and three years at a normal college where I was an average student missing everything I could miss and still pass <laughs> to being an acting student where I never missed one day. Like, really? never, never, never. Just, just loved it, loved every single second of it, you know. Did you still get the journalism communications degree? Yeah, you it, yeah. <laughs> I started laughing when you said that Somehow. because that's my degree too. <laughs> it is really. Yes, and it, 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 I also haven't used it for <laughs> <its> intended purposes. <laughs> right. so. Well, this is kind of it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It absolutely counts. Um, it makes me feel a little bit better about those student <laughs> loans. Um, so I heard you did a year course. It was at the Actors Center yeah, in the Sydney. Actors Center in Sydney. And was there like a special method they taught, or I mean, you were just yeah. you had just sort of made the decision decision to do this where did you even start oh yeah no I, that, I fluked it I completely <laughs> fluked it but this this course was great and it ended up having a lot of the teachers and it was a one-year part-time course it was three days a week but it was intense I wished it was five days a week and I got right into it and I had to tell you actually I haven't told many people this but I auditioned I got in and then the next day they sent me a letter saying please uh, send the check for three and a half thousand dollars now australia when i was graduated all tertiary education all college was free like every place you went was free right it's not quite free now it's maybe two thousand bucks a year but it's still pretty amazing if you think you can give bring your kids up anyway it's a good spot to go but and i was like and i just finished a degree and it was three and a half thousand dollars i of course didn't have three and a half thousand dollars and I thought, I can't really ask my dad for three and a half grand. And I, because, you know, I've just, he just helped me out getting through college and da da da. So I, I put it in the bin. And I am not joking, the next day I got in the mail 
a check from my father's mother's um, will, three and a half thousand dollars. You're kidding. I swear to you. Oh my God. And then I, I was like, oh, it's a sign. And then I went, oh, I should check with my dad mm -hmm. how he feels about it because I was bequeathed three and a half thousand dollars. And I, I, and I said, dad, I'm thinking of using for this. And I remember him saying, I couldn't think of a better way for you to use Grant's money. Really? Yeah, he always was really supportive. He thought I was a bit too thin-skinned to be an actor. <laughs> he was an accountant, right? He's at Price Waterhouse his whole life. So a kid who wanted to be an actor to him was just like another planet. But he goes, look, I think you have the talent, but I think you're a bit thin-skinned. And I never forget Wow, it. that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I still don't read reviews to this day. I don't, <laughs> he was probably right. And then I've heard you say, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is the quote I learned, but um, you went to the Western Academy of Performing Arts, yep. and you said you were the dunce of the class? That was at the Actors Center. Oh, that was, was at the, the Actors Center. I, no, I definitely felt like the dunce when I began. Really? Yeah, I just, I had no idea what I was doing, and, and everyone, everyone was really cool, and beaten leather jackets, and cigarettes, and, <laughs> and I was like a... Labrador puppy. <laughs> not, not even a grown up Labrador. I was like, yeah, voice class, let's go. Like, <laughs> what else are we doing? Oh, 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 yeah, I'm in. And I could just see, I can see right now the, the, the teacher's face. I remember he used to smoke a cigarette like that. <laughs> and he just thought, who is this guy? Like, get out of here. Find some pain and then come back. Like, you're wasting my time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I was gonna say it's it's a little unfortunate your dad was so supportive because you didn't have that angst of you know needing to prove dad wrong that's true yeah. I found some angst don't worry <laughs> <laughs> no one in this room hasn't got some angst somewhere um, but you, I, I avoided the question you asked which is a good one about the, the style and oh, yes. it really emanated from the central school of drama so this school the staff came from that so it was a more that British thing which was Yes, Stanislavski, but also um, the way I was taught Stanislavski, there was two books, Stanislavski books, uh, being an actor, and I can't remember the name of the other one, but the one that sparked the method was being an actor, right? It was all about the internal life mm -hmm. and the, 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 you create a character from the inside out. But actually Stanislavski wrote another book which came out 20 years later because of the, what was happening with communism, etc. And that's literally about putting on noses, walks, and, and creating character from the outside in. This is how it was described to me. I bought it anyway. So really, I think we were taught both. So as an actor, you use whatever you use. You use your past. You use what you observe. Sometimes putting on a wig or a costume or a shoe or a funny nose or an accent can just sort of be a great trigger to get you into the life of a character. So I kind of, the school basically was both, both of those, inside out and outside in. And what kind of career were you hoping for or envisioning? Did you think it would be stage or was the plan to always go out? I thought out probably and, stage. Really? Yeah, I, I've really, I, I mean, I've, Uta Hagen's book, I would say was Respect for Acting, was when I completely fell in love with the craft. Um, but it was the John Barton tapes, How to Play Shakespeare. I'm sure you guys have, I don't know if you've ever seen those. I've only seen one. So Barton was at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And at that time, Judy Dench, Ian McKellen, Alan Howard Bates, Suchet, Never heard Patrick of Stewart, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. The list goes on, was kind of their beginning. And so he would bring them in and, sh and use them on these eight tapes, I think it is, on How to Play Shakespeare. And I remember thinking my goal, my dream would be to go to the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre in London. You have to understand, my parents emigrated from England, so the English thing was a very strong thing because I was going back there all the time. My mum lived in England, so I was going back and seeing theatre there. So when I was at the National Theatre, I had a picture when I was a student at Whopper outside the Cottesloe Theatre like that, and I stuck it up on my wall. You're so kidding. I was 28 when I was at the National Theatre doing Oklahoma, and I remember thinking, oh, that, oh, that's as far as I've dreamt, like this is it. <laughs> Literally everything else in the last 22 years has been an unbelievable bonus, to be honest. Did you watch the Patrick Stewart tape way back then? Oh yeah, it's <laughs> him doing Shylock. So it's an amazing wow. tape because he does Shylock and then he pulls up David Suchet to do his version of Shylock. And they both played Shylock at the RSC. So you see these completely different versions of Shylock back to back. Mm. He must have been so impressed when you met that him. That was a good then. detail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think a lot of people had stopped yeah. him for that. Uh, so what was the first professional job you booked? Uh, it was a TV series called Corelli. Right. Wait. No. No. Oh. It was the Law of the Land. Is that it like Law and Order? <laughs> yeah. Like uh, Australia's Law and Order? Yeah. No, a <laughs> lawyer, a female character who was a lawyer who went to um, the country. So she was a country lawyer. Uh-huh. I played Chica. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'm still embarrassed. I played Chica, who was an AFL football star. Now, AFL is not the code of football I grew up playing. <laughs> and so there is footage of me being the worst AFL player of all time. There's no doubles or anything like that. But I did that for a week. And that was the first thing I had ever did. But I knew already that I had a job, which was as a series regular in an ABC series like the BBC in Australia, an ABC series called Corelli. Mm -hmm. And Corelli was a prison drama. I played a, a prisoner and it was uh, really a story about the prison psychologist who was played by my now wife. So certainly the best thing I remember about it yeah. is uh, meeting Deb. Yeah. Uh, I heard a rumor that you actually booked that on like the final night of your graduation performance or... Yeah, I tell you. Is that true? I, I fully see your journalism training coming through. <laughs> it paid well, off. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. So. Drama school for three years. Now, in Australia, they had this rule where our government channel had to send their casting agent to every single acting school. That's fantastic. Right, as part of the taxpayers, right, so that every had an experience of what it's like to audition for the ABC. So we were in Perth, which is literally like LA to New York, so he came over. And I don't forget, I was playing Romeo and Romeo and Juliet in, we had a, a thing called a two-week Shakespeare, so I'm... You turned up on the Saturday and two weeks later on the Saturday, but, but you didn't know what play you were gonna do oh on the Saturday. And you had two weeks to learn it and I was Romeo. And in the middle Saturday, we had this audition for the ABC person. But everyone knew, they came every year, it was a crock, right? Everybody knew <laughs> it was just a stage thing to make the ABC look like they're egalitarian, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so i never forget, I went in and, uh, it was, the sides were for a prison scene. And we all thought this was just fake and I did it. I, I sort of learned it. There was zero nerves because I thought this was all a waste of time. I went and I, I, I have no memory of it at all. <laughs> and then about a week later, the head of the school knocks on the door of a class. He goes, come here, you're on the short list for an ABC series. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I have an audition, he goes, you auditioned last Saturday? I said, no, that was just the, and he goes, no, that was an audition for a series. I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, you're on the short list. And I, it was four weeks between then and graduation. He said, the day you graduate, you'll be in Melbourne. And we do a showcase in Melbourne and Sydney. And after you've done your showcase in Melbourne, you're gonna do an audition for the entire ABC panel. Oh my God. I was petrified for four weeks. <laughs> you know, when someone says to you, you're on the top of the short list, all my head is saying, you're going to screw this up. <laughs> this is yours to lose, right? That's all I was thinking. And on the day I graduated, uh, I actually found out I got the part. I didn't have to audition. You're That's probably the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. They said, this guy, I remember the, the director said, yeah, I saw your tape. And we were like, who's this guy? He doesn't seem to, he's just in and doing his thing. And <laughs> He doesn't seem to care, he's not nervous, and he's just like, I was like, oh. It was the luckiest thing That's that ever amazing. happened in my life. So, yeah. I mean, are you, were you generally pretty good at auditioning? I'm, I'm not 50, sure if you 50-50. I feel like 50-50. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not great, not terrible. Uh, I got better as I went along. Uh, sometimes nerves would get the better of me. Uh, I was much better if I had three auditions in a day, not too much time to think about it. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I was better if I'd done the work. And there's a period for me with lines where if you just gave me that sheet and we did it, it would be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then I feel I get worse for about the next week <laughs> and then it gets better. So I kind of learned how, you know, things work. And, you know, I took a few tricks. Like for me, I always, sorry if there's any casting directors here, but I always try to trick myself into being the first day of rehearsal. 
at an audition. So if they say, all right, if you could sit in the chair, I go, yeah, I don't know, I think I might stand. They go, all right, you know, just little things yeah. that make me feel like we're working on it. We're not, yeah. it, this is not a, am I a good actor? Do you like me as an actor? This is like, well, let's work on the character. Let's, let's have a go, you know. Since X Men, have you had to audition for anything? Yeah, yeah audition. Oh, you audition oh, for Les Mis. Yeah, I audition for Les Mis. Right. Three hours. Three hours. Three hour audition. And I, the last time I spoke to you, actually, was yeah. your bike stolen yeah, on the so day of your good. audition? Yeah, you so yes, this is insane. Yeah. Uh, First of all, it's insane they auditioned you, but whatever. No, I asked, <laughs> I asked for the audition. Get out. No, because I, Cameron McIntosh wanted me to play Javert, and uh, I don't know if I've told anyone this, by the way. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, luckily no one is on Twitter, or, <laughs> and then there's no cameras. No, Cam, Cam said to me, uh, and he'd asked me to play Javert on stage. He said, "We're doing it. You got to play Javert." I said, "Man, I think I want to play Jean Valjean. That's uh, for me. That's the part." And so I said, "Let me audition. Let me uh, let me just show you, you know, that I can do it." So, um, and I went as I always do. You know, before singing, I go and see my singing teacher, and I planned it out. I wanted to warm up properly, feel great going in, but not long enough for me to cool down. So I was 15 minutes from the end of my uh, singing lesson to the audition. It's about 10 blocks away in New York. I came out, the wheels are gone on my bike. Oh, just the wheels. Oh my God. And the frame was there. And I knew, you know when you know, I'm pulling up, there's a guy sitting on the stoop and his eyes are going, I'm gonna steal your bike. <gasps> And I'm looking and I'm like, you're going to steal my bike. And he's, he's just in the eyes, he's going, you're right, I'm absolutely going to steal my bike. <laughs> and I thought, so I'm just going to tie the, see the chain that's going around the frame. You're going to chain. He's looking at me like, you're an idiot, I'm going to steal the wheels. Because <laughs> you're too spoiled to know how expensive those wheels are. So uh, I came out, the wheels, with, and I knew it. Oh my God. And so I carried the bike over my shoulder because I couldn't fit in, in a cab. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, 15 minutes. <laughs> and I went up to, actually, Tom Hooper was sweet. He goes, just, I'm sweating. It was yeah. up. And then three flights up and the whole thing. So he oh said, just God. sit down, take a second. But it was amazing because I, I, I guess the first 20 minutes was like an audition. And then for him, it was, I was the first actor he'd seen. Um, so it, it, that's when he was starting to develop the idea of singing live and and uh, he was, I was singing and he's up mm -hmm. here. And then he, he would say, stop, stop, stop. And, because the, the pianist was Cameron McIntosh's pianist who played Les Mis for wow. 20 years. Yes. <laughs> right, he's going, 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 stop, stop, stop. He goes, I think I'm gonna be in a close up and we're gonna just pair it, it down, pair it down, throw away the music, just play. It. And so it was kind of a, it was like a rehearsal, it was awesome. Well, at least you knew you could ked, carry Eddie Redmayne through the sewers <laughs> as you exactly. uh, prepped with your bike. <laughs> they only took the wheels, that's so weird. Or is that common? Common. It is. Oh, okay. I now okay. know common. Yeah. <laughs> well, I certainly hope they caught the guy and he was sentenced to 20 years hard labor. No. Yes. <laughs> no, poor guy. Well, I hope he had a good meal or something from him. Yeah. <laughs> um, going back to after Corelli, you played a lot of stage parts, actually. You were Gaston right. in Beauty and the Beast, right. which I think is the best role. Um, I agree. I agree. It's, it was the greatest. You and can I, be as arrogant as you can be for two hours every night. It's terrific. <laughs> it's so much fun. And I was lucky enough to see you in Sunset Boulevard. Well, yeah, as you, oh, oh yes, yeah, you did, you did yeah, me. yeah. Your memory is so much better than mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was amazing. And that was Trevor Nunn. Is and that how it led to Oklahoma? Yeah, and I... I, I was an actor, I, I did theatre and there was a musical theatre school and I, when I did Beauty and the Beast, uh, I, remember, I thought my agent was on drugs when she put me up. I was like, no, nah, I'm an actor. What do you mean? And she says, no, they're really struggling to find someone. So just go for it. And I had lessons and I went and just, anyway, I got the part, but in my contract was I had to have singing lessons once a week that they paid for. And it was really that year when I really sort of, and listening, I would sit on the wings, I'd watch all the singers, and that's really where I learnt it. And then I weirdly couldn't get an audition for a film. Like, I don't know. Really? I, I, I guess you wouldn't experience that here at all, but in Australia there was a weird sort of blind spot that if you're in musicals, you're not an actor, you're a performer, right? And, and, and so I just couldn't even... <laughs> And I wanted to say, do you have any idea how hard it is the hardest. to make song in thought, to make thought through song feel, and it's so hard, it's mm -hmm. the hardest thing.
But anyway, I couldn't. So I, when they said, oh, Sunset Boulevard and Trevor Nunn. So going back, that Trevor Nunn was running Royal Shakespeare Company. So going back to my thing, my dream was yeah. Trevor. But I'd already made this decision. I said, I've got, to, I've got to stop doing musical. Like I'd done that one musical. I've got to try and at least just book TV or book a film because otherwise I'll never get an audition again. So I rang, at this point I knew the casting person. I said, this is the most arrogant thing you've ever heard in your life. I really, really want to meet Trevor, but I don't want to do the show. And she goes, what? Wow. I said, I really want to audition for him. And I guess you can't tell him that I don't want to do the show, but could I please just have an audition? I'm begging you, I'm begging you. I just want to audition for him. It's been, it's been my dream. And she said, all right, all right. So she put me the end of the day, 5.30, and I just never forget, literally five minutes into that audition, audition, I thought, if he wants me to do this part, I would, I would do a pantomime for yeah. Trevor Nunn. He, he came up to me before I sang, it's that song, opening song of um, Act Two, the Sunset Boulevard song. Sure, I came out here to make my name. And oh, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Lyrics, go yeah. on. I think did it 400 <laughs> times. My parking space uh, on waters. Uh, then after a year, year and one room hell, the Murphy bed, a trench cell, wallpaper peeling in the corner. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. That's it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> they put me up to that, by the way, well, to get no. you to sing. I'm <laughs> no, I'm the worst singer in the he world, and I just sang with one of the best singers in the world, so I am like... He came up to me, and he said, I want you to imagine that you're going to have to speak to every single person in the audience, and every single person there is yourself at a younger point in your life, as the character, right? A young Joe Gillis who's looking up at you with a, I can't believe this is what i become. Go. And I, he said, go. <laughs> and it was one of those brilliant bits of direction that just transform a song. Where you're now, you're on stage going, yeah, really, you'd do something different, really? Oh, you'd, you'd do something different, would you? Yeah. So sure, I came out here to make my name, whatever. And everywhere I looked, including the balcony, during that song, Trevor was sitting in a seat. I don't know how the hell he did what? it. I was like, oh, there's Trevor. And then he would get up and I was doing the thing. I'm pretending. And it, oh, there's Trevor. And I was, Holy shit, there's Trevor. He ran around the whole thing and sat in different seats. And then at the end of the number, he goes, great. Now let's do the scene. And I was just in. And, I, and so, oh my God, I tell the longest stories. I'm so oh, sorry. No, but please. yeah, that's how that happened. I just had like a prestige flashback when like your doppelganger shows up in the back of the theater. <laughs> yeah, right. That was Trevor Nunn. Yeah. Now I see what inspired it. Mm. Um, so then he asked me to come to Oklahoma. And in many ways, I mean, is it safe to say Oklahoma kind of changed your life? I For mean, sure. I don't know that, I, sure. I know X-Men happened right after that. So yeah. it was kind of a one-two punch. Yeah, no, that, it was a big change because, um, Trevor taught me a lot about being a better actor for life. And also, I think confidence. I think he, you know, I, I went to a school in Perth. I was Australian. All of a sudden, I was in my dream. At, but he was the one who really made me feel like it's, you can be on a stage on Broadway, a stage in the West End, stage in Sydney, a film. You deserve to be there. He gave me that confidence, I think, that I probably didn't have before mm. then. And you mentioned sort of how X-Men, the audition, came right. along and you sort of, you, you probably weren't that invested when you didn't originally get the role because, like you yeah. said, the script was kind of silly. I was, well, no, <laughs> it was silly about my dad No, I shouldn't was. say that, yeah. But no, <laughs> I rem wow, this is another story I don't think I've told, but <laughs> the story was a little, because I was, this is before Dugray got it. So it was probably clearly Dugray, me, maybe a couple of others. And they said, we're going to fly you to wherever, L LA, I think, to do an audition. I said, uh, what? L uh, how do I do that? Because I'm on a Broadway show. I only have Sunday off. I mean, it was a West End show. I only have Sunday off. And they said, um, well, you just have to miss some shows. And I said, yeah, no, I can't miss a show. <laughs> they said, well, it's a big 
the gig and I said, I'm in a West End musical. <laughs> like, that's a big deal to me. Mm-hmm. And I said, how do I turn up the next day to my cast saying, yeah, I wasn't there because I was auditioning. You know, mm-hmm. I, it's just not the way the theatre works, right? You're in, you're in. And particularly, that's sort of, that was my dream. Anyway, so they said, we're going to fly you Concord then. Oh, no, oh, first they said, well, it's off. And I said, oh, well, never mind, not meant to be. So then they came back and said, well, we'll fly you Concord. I was like, I'm in. I'm like, <laughs> They said, you'll make it, you'll fly. Yeah. You'll do the audition, you'll fly back and you'll be there. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> I just couldn't believe I was going on the Concorde, yeah. right? You know, I was, I was a theater actor. I'd never earned more than like 1200 bucks a week. I was like, this is unbelievable. And I was like, I, if I don't get the part, whatever, I'll find the Concorde. Man. <laughs> And every week, the director, uh, something happened or got sick. And so he was booked for five weeks in a row. And then at the end of the fifth week, they said, oh, he's going to go with someone else. I was like, no, Concord. (laughs) (laughs) And then the Concord went out of use. I was like, oh. Yeah, I was going to say that. But then it kind of came back six months later, weirdly. Wow. Mm. Um, Have you ever met Duke? Because I know he wasn't able to do it because he he was doing Mission Impossible 2, yeah, I think. He's the coolest guy. Like, Such a great I, And I will never forget this moment. I, I had already been hired when we, when we started the job of X-Men. I'd been hired to be the host of a new studios. It was a Fox, um, 20th Century Fox was opening up a studios in Australia. And they'd hired me to go and, you know, everyone was there. Nicole Kimberlin, Kate Blanchett, Russell. They were shooting Mission Impossible down there. So they had... Tom was there, Dugray was there shooting Mission Impossible 2. So I didn't know that at the press conference, they had all the talents sort of lined up and one by one, we was meant to step forward. And uh, so it was going down the names, Kate Blanchett, and they said, and Dugray Scott, I remember going, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and as he stepped forward, he did that <laughs> to me. Uh, and he went like that, he gave me a little wave. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, Dude, I feel really awkward about this. And he goes, stop. He goes, man, it's the greatest part. You're going to absolutely kick ass. Go crush it. And I, and I remember thinking, oh, that's a class act. That's, that's a, a class, class act. act, yeah. yeah. Do you send him flowers every week? Yeah, I or? should. <laughs> I should. <laughs> whiskey. I yeah. think Nico's more a whiskey man. <laughs> um, I think because this was 18, actually more like 20 years ago probably, mm. that the first X-Men movie was really in production. <laughs> and I think it's hard to remember that back then superhero movies weren't necessarily right. good. Right. Like now they come out yeah. regularly and they're always pretty solid, but mm. it was really a gamble. Yeah. And when you were making it, I mean, did you have any idea it would, you know, all these years no. later you'd still be playing this character? No, I had no idea. I, I really, I had not been exposed to X-Men growing up, so I actually did not, oh God, here's an embarrassing story. <laughs> so I had three weeks after I started to get into shape. I really wasn't in shape, right? Wait, what's not in shape for you? <laughs> <laughs> if you rewind, if you look at X-Men 1, there's a scene where I first, uh, I somehow wake up inside the mansion in those blue hallways, right? Yes. And I got my shirt off. You watch how Brian Singer shoots around my body. <laughs> angles it's here it's and someone if if you have a look at that you'll see you know, average joe right so the opening scene of the movie mm-hmm. brian pushed to the very end of the movie so the whole the scene in the fight? cage was oh. five months later oh wow i was i never got it really i mean i'd put on some size for gaston that was the other thing in my contract i had to be 200 pounds and i was like 175 pounds as a skinny guy wow. So I had to put on 25 pounds for that. So I'd done a little bit of it, but I was, you know, I, I was enjoying life. I was post, <laughs> post eight shows a week, and, you know. Um, oh, was some, what were we saying before that? Oh, I was just asking if you had any idea, like how long of an impact oh. it would have. So this was the embarrassing story I was gonna tell. I had three weeks and I was reading the comics, even though Brian didn't want anyone to read comics. No, no comics were allowed on set because he, he Back th- he thought everyone's going to come with a two-dimensional version, mm-hmm. and he had this whole idea, which opens the movie, which was quite revolutionary at the time. I think this idea of like seeing Magneto in a concentration camp, or right. you know, just sort of making him very human. So I'm reading this thing, and I see Wolverine, and I'm like, well, clearly Wolverine's not an. A- I never heard of a Wolverine, right? I didn't know that animal existed. Yeah. So I thought it was a comic book speak for Wolf. So I 
saw an IMAX, the Wolf movie. I went to the. <laughs> I went to the zoo. Wolves always are looking down because their sense of smell. I'm like, yeah, well, that's weird. Wolverine's sense of smell, this is it. And that's why he's always looking up through their eyebrows because they're actually smelling the whole time. And I'm like, develop. And the first day, I was showing a fight scene, that, a, a choreography that I've been working on. And Brian came over to have a look at it. And he's like, what are you doing with your body, man? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, this weird thing. And I said, oh, well, you know, I'm sort of playing with this idea of being a wolf. And he goes, why? <laughs> I said, because I'm sort of half wolf, half marine. Right? Isn't that the mythology? He goes, no, you're a wolverine. I said, well, there's no such thing. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> Go to the zoo. They're just down there, right oh, down no. the road. So, I was, yeah. They were probably right next to the wolves that you were looking at. Probably. <laughs> so that was humiliating. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from the audience from uh, Jenna, um, who has very nice handwriting, uh, wants to know what was it like for you to say goodbye to that character it was, last uh, year? Jenna, are you there? Yes. Hi, Jenna. <laughs> um, it was really, uh, it was nerve wracking uh, until we premiered it in Berlin, which to me, I had, when we were sort of pitching the whole idea, Jim and I, we said, let's, let's, before we tell you the story, we want you to know that we want to see a film that could premiere at the Berlin Film Festival, <laughs> all right? So, seen as a film, the kind of film that non-superhero fans would, would go to and that superhero fans would go to, right? So, we were in Berlin and when, I, when that finished, I was sitting next to Patrick Stewart and Jim. I just remember the tear, I think it was relief, <laughs> it was sadness, it was, I, I was really, proud of the movie and I don't mind telling you that but I think most actors would you know mostly not proud so to feel that pride was something and I I felt like we'd got to the essence of that character that I had felt for a long time was always there so in it, it was very bittersweet but um, yeah complicated I hear there's someone told me maybe there'd be a, a Wolverine here Wolverine is that here true tonight. did he get oh. in did he did he oh he's way back there yeah. <laughs> Come on, dude. That's a nice looking one. And the a little hair little curl and in the hair, baseball <laughs> cap. You could, you could <laughs> Do you have the claws too? Have or they the probably claws? wouldn't let you in with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's nice. Holy mackerel. <laughs> dude, oh, you got the suit and everything. That's awesome. Wow. And th does the dog tag say hands. Logan? That's awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Good to see you. <laughs> that's so good. I explained. <laughs> well, mate, jump for grabs. So. That's, the, that's the real deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, mate, if you need a day off, just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that would kind of be yes. cool. That was cool. That was so yeah. cool. <laughs> I love it. Don't, don't tell Liev Schreiber because he, think, he <laughs> thinks he's your younger brother. Yeah. <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> oh, he was older. That's oh, right. Yeah. Okay, my bad. But he was. Oh wait, he was also in uh, Kate and Leopold with yes, you. Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was just watching Kate and Leopold, my dad's favorite movie. <laughs> um, and uh, Viola Davis is in that. That's right. She plays a cop that tickets that's you. That's right. For pick, yes. It's like one of her first movies. Yeah. She's like, well, that's right. I'm walking the dog, and the dog poops. And she yeah. Says, You're gonna pick that up. I'm like, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Aristocrat, absolutely yeah. not, I think is my line. Yeah. That's right, it's my whole Davis. It was so crazy. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. Wow. Uh, speaking of, you know, the movies you made one. right after X-Men, I think in the same year you did Kate Leopold, Swordfish, and Someone Like You. Yeah. Like, all back to back. I mean, how are you sort of, when you have such a major breakthrough like that, how do you navigate your career? And do people sort of sit down with you and say, like, you yeah. know, let's talk about stamina? <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I, I have an amazing agent. I've been with one agent my whole career, Patrick Weitzel. Oh, is, he's so Christian Bale's agent too, right? He's Christian oh, Bale's okay, agent. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So he's pretty good. He's, he's, yeah. he's doing all right. <laughs> and um, he was always fantastic. He, he always had a long-term vision. So he saw me on stage at Oklahoma. Um, I remember coming here first with uh, my London agent, 
and seeing a bunch of uh, uh, agents here doing meetings. And Patrick stood out. I remember a couple of people <laughs> when I was here like, hey, man, Oklahoma is amazing. You're so good. I was like, oh, you saw it? No, I just heard it was great. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So <laughs> Patrick was, uh, he said to me, long term, you're a theater actor, your plays, musicals, film, that's who you are. And I, I, I remember t even 10 years in, people were saying, who are you, man? Like, you've got to decide, are you going to be action movies? Are you going to be this? In Broadway, like, people don't know where to place you and this is a problem. And he was always like, no. This is about, he always talked about as an actor, as an artist, about growing and doing the things you want to do. So, but he said, but I want you to be careful, you're new to film. You're really a theatre guy, you're new to film, and you need to learn, and I don't want to put you, I could put you in a film where you're above title because of X-Men's success, I could put you in that if you want it. But I want you to learn and be with other great actors and great directors mm -hmm. and, and to learn. And so. I, I sometimes, since then, I won't mention names, I see people who like burst onto the scene and then I see them in two things immediately where they're above title. And I, I go, oh, don't do it, man. Like, yeah. you never know, it might work out, but if those first two things after you break are bombs, whoosh, you're gone, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's what I, one thing I love about Patrick and his strategy is always, always long term. And when I went to do The Boy From Oz, uh, I mean, X-Men 2 was just about to happen when I got the call about doing The Boy From Oz on Broadway. And I just knew I had to do it. And so everybody else, apart from my agent, was saying, "That's the you know, this is crazy. You can't go off now and do 18 months on Broadway. This mm -hmm. is some point, yes, but now things are happening. You've got to go with it, ride with it. And, and he was like, man, if you feel, if, if you're lucky enough as an artist to get that feeling, I've got to do this, and you can do that, you must go and do it. And, and I, I, God bless him, I love him to this day for many reasons, but that's one of the things I love him for, yeah. You know, I, um, The Boy From Oz is the only show I've ever won lottery seats to. You guys were in previews, yeah. yeah, and so I got to sit in the front row, and it's just such a phenomenal show, and, and I know that this is a cliche question, but I mean, you, everything you do in that show, how did you have the stamina for eight shows a week? That was the hardest thing I ever did, for sure. I wondered. Like, well, it was 20 songs a night and dancing and... I know all I, those songs, too. You do? Yes. <laughs> if you were wondering who oh. I am... Yeah, okay, so, no, no, I won't, I won't, I won't. <laughs> That's not the most famous one, It's my favorite. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm literally just blanking on all the other lyrics for that. Again, I I'm a man under, like any other man. man. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, and now I've got a new question. What, what was the question? At what point are you starting to get scared? No, no, never. I love it. You know I love it. What, what was uh, the just the again? stamina of doing that role. I remember having, I started getting very sore in one of my feet and I went to the doctor because I had dance shoes on and I was jumping off the piano and mm -hmm. Peter Allen, if you don't know, was like, he was the guy who invented the, you know, he, no, well, he didn't invent it, but he got off R Little Richard when he was a kid. He used to, on an upright oh, piano, put his foot up there, like he's in the split and then play, seeing him play upside down, yeah. jump off and do all that stuff. So I was very sore on the foot. I went to the doctor and I said, I, I can't get rid of this pain in my foot. And so he x-rayed it and I had multiple stress fractures in my feet. Jeez. And he goes, dude, you need six weeks off. I was like, right, that's <laughs> right. And he goes, no, really, you need six weeks. I said, I can't, man. I'm, and he goes, so we re-choreographed. So that's my strong foot for pirouettes and dancing. So I had to re-choreograph wow. the other foot and just live in ice baths. And I remember limping across the line. It was one of those shows where we started off not great. We didn't get great reviews. And then it kind of built and became a thing by the end. And so... I think we just made a profit about a month before we finished, really? right? Which was is not easy in Broadway. To, within a year to to become profitable is unusual, but we were profitable. And the producers came to said, and I can still remember the date, September sixteenth. They said, "Look, can we extend from September sixteenth for three months?" And I said, "I can't." Yeah. And they said, two months to." I said, oh, "One week." And I said, I, "I'm so sorry, I can't." September 16th, it's, it'd be like running the marathon and someone saying, can you just run back to the beginning? Like, <laughs> that was, nothing will be as hard as that. But also so rewarding and a, a time I'll never forget.
Did you? I have a debate going on with a friend who saw the show with me. I seem to recall you rode an elephant or a camel. Oh, uh, the, the Tony Awards. Was that what it was? Okay, yeah. see, it's so weird how memories are. I could have sworn. So when I, when we performed at the Tony Awards, they have a camel. There they just have one there for the Christmas show. <laughs> so really? what Peter Allen performed with the Rockettes, right here at, yeah. at, Radio, at Radio City Music Hall. And he was the highest selling artist ever at Radio City Music Hall. And he was back there one day, he goes, what's the smell back here? This, and they go, oh, the camel. And I go, the camel for the Christmas show. And they went, yeah. And it lived there all year round. Back wow. There. Yeah. This is, well, whenever he was there, it was there. And they said, well, I want to use the camel. So he would come on with the camel shaking his maracas. That's amazing. So. But they don't do that anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, but uh, that camel, who actually, for the Tony Awards, I'm just remembering, <laughs> is the offspring, I couldn't tell if it was a girl or boy, the offspring of the camel that Peter <laughs> Allen rode. That's amazing. I sat on going on to the Tony Awards. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Not everyone has ridden a camel <laughs> shaking maracas <laughs> on the Radio City <laughs> Music Hall stage, right? <laughs> and of course, you won a Tony Award for yeah. that performance. Mm -hmm. um, and then something I think is just so cool and weird is you won an Emmy Award for hosting the Tony. <laughs> <laughs> it's I was like, like, yeah, yeah, out of this one show, they yeah, uh, that if you're going to put under the heading of only in America, like only in America <laughs> can you win an award for hosting an award show. <laughs> Because no one does award shows like America. Everyone else, no one else, literally no one yeah. else does it. And the Tony Awards to me is, uh, honestly, I, I love that show and, and I've been blessed to have done it. And then when they, I, I never forget getting the call for the, for the Oscars. I'm just going into anecdotes here. Do you no, 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 I was, I was literally about Sorry. to ask you. Yeah. yeah. I was on a press junket for a movie and it was one o'clock in the morning and I got the call and it was Steven Spielberg. and. I'm here with Sid Gaines and the Board of Governors. We'd love for you to, you know, do this, host the Oscars. And I, I don't remember, I just remember saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think I, I think I even said, yeah, I'll give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> I hung up the phone and I was sitting there in shock. Because of course you're gonna say, yeah, right, of course. Yeah. We came from Australia, like Northern, yes, I'm gonna do that. And then I was like, what the hell was I thinking? I'm not Billy Crystal. And my wife walked in and saw me just pale. And I said, babe, you're about to get in the bed with the host of the 81st Academy Awards. <laughs> and she, I never get literally, she goes, Billy Crystal's here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> She's <Wow>. very funny. <laughs> uh, why have you never hosted again? You were such a great host. I have to imagine they've asked. I have been asked twice, and both times I was working when they were doing it. And mm. I, I, I just hats off to anybody who can work on a job and do that at the same yeah. time. Because really the show, it's a unique show. There's no show really until the nominations come out. That's because right. pretty much yeah. everything is predicated on who's performing, what things are up, if you're the host, it's those first seven or eight minutes. Oh God, I remember the first production meeting for it. And I went in and I thought, oh, I just had this thing, it's the Oscars, there's a whole team and then this, and we sat down, it was about six people. I was like, oh, okay. And we sit down and I looked at this one sheet of paper and it had segment one, two, three, through to segment 12. There's 12 segments and 12 commercial breaks. Segment one, Hugh Jackman opening, seven slash eight minutes, question mark. And, I was, and, then they, and they said, right, let's move on to sec, uh, section two. And I was like, uh, the segment one, have you guys got any ideas on that? What are you, what are you thinking? I said, no, 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 that's your seven or eight minutes. Go for it. Billy Crystal holds the record. He did it for 14 minutes once in the heyday. Wow. I wouldn't recommend 14, but seven or eight minutes, whatever you want to do. So segment two. <laughs> Bye. Anyway, <laughs> we got there at the end. But the thing that the greatest thing that another bit of good fortune before I went on stage, I really, I was working with Rob and Dan, um, who just came up with this great idea. It was financial crisis, and they yeah. had this great idea of the budget Oscars, and I, I just fell in love. So I felt, I felt good about. It. I, I was really excited, excited about doing it. Mm -hmm. And then about 
a minute before when they pull me to the curtain and I'm about to go out there. I remember looking out, seeing Meryl Streep, and man, did I just get, the reality just hit me so far. <laughs> And then what the hell was I thinking? What the, yeah. And I just went into the abyss of like, oh, I literally like this. And Valdez, who's been the, the, the stage manager there for about 30 years, he was like, 30 seconds, 20 seconds. I remember him saying, 15 seconds and uh, good luck out there. There's only about a billion people watching. If you ever see the tape of me walking on the Oscars, I'm literally laughing, looking into... If it wasn't for that moment, I would have just probably thrown up. <laughs> he just knew. I was like, I've got yeah, yeah. to get this guy out of this funk he's in. <laughs> That's amazing. Haven't you also, though, performed at Radio City Music Hall and, like, uh, in these big venues? I, uh, I saw your One Night Only show, which I think... Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And you, you talked about... Uh, in Australia, we did... You mean, like, arenas and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm remembering a story oh, you told Carnegie about your father. Hall. Carnegie oh, Hall. Yeah. Yes, that's what it was. So, uh, 1998, I was asked to... It was the centenary of Richard Rogers, um, and they were doing uh, Carousel at Carnegie Hall, and they asked me to come and sing that lead part, Billy, with Audra McDonald and a bunch of people. And I, I was I, I, so excited about it, but again, super nerve. First time I'd sung, and this was only two years after I'd done my first musical, so it was kind of still a bit new to me. And I told my dad, my dad is the sweetest man alive. Like, you know, my dad is like, no matter anything I've ever done, acting-wise, he says exactly the same thing. He's always like, Hugh. Wonderful work. <laughs> Super earnest, wonderful work. I mean, Van Helsing, it just really... <laughs> oh. So, when I rang and told him about Carousel, he couldn't hide the real enthusiasm. He was like, oh my God, oh, I'm coming. That's gonna be so great. And my dad never missed a day of work in his life. He worked at Price Waterhouse his entire working life. And he came. These are the only three days he missed. And three days, because it's a 24-hour flight mm -hmm. from Australia to New York. He was in New York for less than a day. Then a 24-hour flight, straight back and straight wow. to the office, right? And he's an accountant. He wanted to know everything, the, the itinerary, the hotels, <laughs> timings, <laughs> dress code. I told him it was black tie, everything, right? And on the day, he's on the plane, and I find out it's not black tie, it's business casual. Really? And I'm like, I had this image of my dad arriving for 12 hours with like black tie yeah. and like shorts and flip flops, you know, <laughs> from Australia. And so the moment he landed, I rang him and I told him, and that was the day of the performance. And he said, don't worry, I've got it covered, it's fine. I, I've got something else, it's fine. And he said, but Hugh, while I got you, do me a favor, it would mean a lot to me if I could come and meet you at your hotel room and walk you to the stage door at Carnegie Hall. Oh yeah, that's what I thought. And I was like, I said, of course. I said, meet me at 6.15 or whatever. I said, meet me at 6.15, we'll walk over together. So 6.15 on the dot, he's an accountant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I open up the door and there is my father in the hallway of, my, uh, of the hotel in full black tie. Oh, really? And I'm like, uh, Dad, it's not black. Seriously, no one's wearing black tie. Nobody, except for the choir. Everyone's going to think you're a baritone, Dad, please. <laughs> And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, Hugh, my son is singing in Carnegie Hall. It's black tie for me. Oh my God. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, he, and Carnegie Hall is sort of modeled on those great European opera houses. Mm -hmm. Are you getting a little misty? I am, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and uh, because of the way they do those things, there's the lights at the back. You can see basically into the audience. And I, when I wasn't seeing, I was sitting down because we was a reading. So I was sitting down. I looked up, and I just could see the tears. Oh from, like, God! From my dad to be a Carnegie Hall. That yeah. Was, yeah. That's amazing. That was, that was for me something I'll never forget. Who's your dad's favorite actor? Oh. <laughs> His favorite show. Growing up was Six Million Dollar Man. You're kidding me! Wow. My, and my dad like went to Cambridge. He had a a first. He got a law degree, a business degree, Shakespeare, this and that, and everything. Loved the Six Million Dollar Man until they made the Six Million Dollar Woman. Oh yeah. He loved really good guilty pleasure TV. That's awesome. 
Six million dollar man. That's his favorite. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have to get the front runner, which I know you guys just watched, but I just there's a couple movies I just want to touch on because you've worked with so many amazing directors yeah. and so many great mm. people. Um, I, I just personally, I want to talk about The Prestige because yeah. it's one of my favorite movies of all time, um, and. You actually played dual roles in that, right. and you were so good that I literally thought they found an actor who looked kind <laughs> of like you yeah. to play your double. Yeah. And it was like, and then there was, I remember reading reports about like people would tell me, no, 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 that's a different actor. I met him. Right, yeah. And then, but that but was people you. People argued to me. <laughs> You're kidding. I said, no, I played, no, you didn't. No, you didn't play. I said, no, I did. No, no you didn't. Like, I was like, <laughs> okay. I didn't. That's got to be the highest compliment, though. The best. I was, I'll, I'll go with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did, we did little things. I had a little bit of a prosthetic on my nose mm -hmm. just to make that different. Uh, you see, I have no earlobes, so we added earlobes. And there was one other thing. Oh, the teeth. And just that, that was the, the thing. That's that amazing. Yeah. And I mean, Christopher Nolan just one of the greatest directors there, there is. You've also worked with um, Darren Aronofsky yeah. in The Fountain. You've worked I gotta with tell you, you guys are all actors, you'll love this. So my, my, my lawyer at this point had, you know, they're like, I worked really hard on getting your deal, like for this, so you're gonna have, <laughs> the, like the family can fly to be with you, or this and that. And Nolan rang up uh, and said, we don't believe in a trailer for each other. Like, can you share a trailer, you and Krishna? I was like, yeah, sure. And my lawyer goes, well, what do you know, but if you give up your trailer, You'll never have it again. Like, you know, you get us. Anyway, Chris rang up and he said, Here's the thing with the trailer. I, I'm come from Australia. Like, you bring your own chair, you bring your own lunch. Like, yeah. <laughs> the half trailer is better than my place in Australia. It's fine. It's, it's all good. And he goes, Here's my deal. You and Christian will share a trailer. I promise you, you'll never sit in your trailer for more than two hours. And I will never go overtime on any single shooting day. Wow. And he was true to his word. That's amazing. I mean, isn't that amazing? Yeah. He's never done ADR, yeah. never done That's ADR, really? never gone over budget, never gone over time. You think of the, ma the massive movies he's made. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm. And yet, massive movies, and yet his characters are yeah. so specific and well drawn. Because his scripts, I, have, I feel like if you stopped him now, he would know the next five movies. I think he and his brother, he was, when we were, you know, he was talking the Batman trilogy, he knew what that was from the beginning. He actually told me, funnily enough, he had his idea for Batman. Really? I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, I'm going to get in trouble saying this, <laughs> but he had it back, way back, when, we, when X-Men came out. So when was the first Batman? Must have been 2005 or something? Sounds right. Yeah. Right. So X-Men came out in 2000. He said, I had, he said, I walked into the theater, I saw the first 20 minutes of X-Men. He was like, ah, that's my idea. Because he was like, really? I wanted to do something, yeah, just a little more human. Um, but anyway, Nolan, yes, Aronofsky, who I adore. So many uh, amazing directors. Yeah. What do you hope for from a director when you show up to a set? Mm. It's a director's medium for film, and that was a big adjustment for me because in theatre, of course, the director is there, but from the moment you open, for the next 12 months, you as a cast are running the show. So it's a slightly, the, the balance of power is slightly different, but you have to, I want to be able to just innately trust. It's funny, Jason Ryman, who I just worked with on this, he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, my job is to understand the psychology of every single person on that set because I need to know how they work. I don't want them to work in my way. I want them to work in their way, but I need to know how to get the best out of them. Now, as an actor, whether it's an acting teacher or a director, you want someone who gets you. Mm. But the frightening thing is when you work, and, and brilliant thing, but it's frightening too, when someone is so smart that they get you even the bits you're trying to hide. <laughs> because we all have bits, even as actors, we're like, yeah, a bit uncomfortable with that, but I'm gonna cover that. I'm gonna hide that bit, and let's hope we get away with it. You know, there's, with Jason, there was no hiding, and it was such a relief to be able to say, I'm really struggling with this scene. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm sorry, I know, I, I get it here, I just don't get it here. Or you can, like, those kinds of things I thought, I can't share that with it. I thought it'd be a burden for a director. I, I sort of felt if you're the lead in the film, you're like the quarterback. No coach wants the quarterback to go, yeah, I'm, I know there's two minutes left to go in the game. I don't, <laughs> I'm just not feeling great about this, this drive. I, 
just been nervous. I don't know. I don't know what to do. What do you think? What should we do? Like, I thought your job is to go, give me the ball, coach. Give me the ball. I don't worry. I've got it. But actually, what I learned, and I'm using Jason as an example, and I could use it for Jim Mangold or several other people I've worked with. When you can just really trust them, not only your performance, but your process of how to work, that is the holy grail for mm-hmm. me. Oh, we actually have a question from, um, is it Ann Westcott? We still on Jenna's question, by the way. Was that, <laughs> <laughs> that could have been the longest answer of all time. <laughs> Ann was wondering, do you see yourself directing in the near future? Not really. No. I, 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 where's Ann? Where's Ann? Where are you, Ann? Oh, oh hi, yeah. Ann. Uh, I'm, I'm a really, um, I love acting. I'm a quite indecisive person. I, when I feel... Clarity, I just love it. It's, you know, and when it happens, you go, ah, oh, that's terrific. And I live and am married to someone who's a born director. And I go, mm. and, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a different, it's not just a skill set. It's a different, whole different way of thinking. It's a confidence of vision, literal vision, as well as artistic vision. And I think the crew would just get... I would drive them crazy. <laughs> what do you think, red dress or yellow dress? Yeah, yeah, they're great. No, which one? <laughs> which one? Like, it'd be a bit like that. And I, I'm just still really loving acting. Uh, you have the kind of a very unique distinction. You've done two movie musicals between Les Miserables and Greatest Showman. Yeah. The Greatest Showman was something really unique. It's an original musical. Right. Like at Les Mis, at least we knew that you right. know that property works. Yeah. Um, and I know you spent years getting yeah. it right. I mean, do you want to keep bringing more musicals to the big? Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love it. <laughs> no, if if I could write the script of my life like every th- three years and I only say three years because I think it ta- does take mm-hmm. time to develop them and to write the songs but it, is, it was absolutely thrilling experience we had nine weeks on both those films you had nine weeks of rehearsal because obviously with dance and song uh, you need to be ready to go because you can't be wasting time on the set it's too expensive with the crew there and everything so it was heaven. It was yeah. like a nine-week rehearsal period and then just joyously filming. It was, I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. I thought I was so clever going as the bearded lady for Halloween this, this season. <laughs> yeah. There were so many bearded so ladies. Many, yeah, right. yeah, I mean, uh, I think my beard was a little better, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to show me the pic later. I will actually, um, Pat, uh, uh, Justin Paul. Um, uh, commented on oh, it. Really? Yes, yes. Oh, that's good. He said, "This is you." <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the front runner, which is such a fa- oh, you guys just saw it. It's very rare that we show it and then do a career conversation. Okay. So I don't need to sell it. You know it's good. Um, uh, how did this project sort of find its way to you? And what, is it the people that attracted you? The story? A little bit of both? Uh, Jason rang me. Um, mm send me the script. I was reading it with an inner monologue of please like this, please like this, because I love Jason's films. Yeah. And there's less and less of them being made of, of real humans, gray, flawed humans, you know. And, and I didn't really know much about it. I'm an Australian. I was backpacking with four Aussie mates around Europe. I don't remember much of like months of that year. Let alone. Um, but the moment I started reading it, I, I was enamored with the character. It was something I had never really got to play before. And this dichotomy of someone who's intensely private, complex, um, mercurial, enigmatic, also coupled with the privacy was this person who was seeking the most public job in the world and really had some amazing ideas. Um, so the character itself, but also I just the... I mean, I read this before, the, this is 2015, the script was oh, written wow. in 2015, so it's become incredibly relevant. Uh, <laughs> as Jason says, he would prefer if it was a little less relevant, actually. <laughs> um, but it, I think there were the connective tissue, and like all of us here, it seems so unrecognisable. So much of what we see in the papers or what's going on seems unrecognisable. It's a really interesting part of history that really mm-hmm. gives some uh, connective tissue to today. So I... I, lo- I, I hope you guys feel this, but it's a movie that there's no heroes or villains. There's a bunch of humans. It asks a lot of questions um, and of ourselves as well, of the part we play in the process, you know. 
So rather than just simply did he or didn't he, mm-hmm. you know, have an affair, like why are we so interested in that? And does that matter to us? Does that disqualify him as potentially being a president or not? Anyway, so I loved all of that, all of those things, but I was probably 30 minutes into reading it knowing yeah. I wanted to do it. Was it like a relief? You're like, oh, thank God, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was because I just, I just love Jason's films. Um, I think maybe the closest thing there is to a hero might be Lee, honestly, right. in right. some ways, or even the Washington Post reporter. Yes, you know, uh, it's absolutely. I, yeah, I think journalists are going to love this movie. I so. think it's, I think it's also very <laughs> redemptive for Donna Rice's mm-hmm. character, and beautifully played by Sarah Paxton, uh, and I. I think I was, I'm proud to be part of a film that really is very strong on the female characters because the, this shift in gender politics really did start then, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but you see, you know, Anne DeVroy, you know, that character, the Washington Post, being the only woman in those rooms yep. and all those decisions are being made, you know, and it's massive, but um, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Travis Ritchie. <coughs> Um, hey, uh, do you feel more pressure when portraying real people than yeah. original characters? Yeah. And how does that compare with bringing a beloved character? Well, see, I think Wolverine is real. So <laughs> I don't. But, <laughs> but how does just that. took a break. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. Uh, you know, we all know this. I mean, we spend our lives creating stories, people's stories. You have to get inside, fall in love with those characters. And in the play or film or TV show, whatever you're doing, put that character's story out. Our stories of who we are, how we project ourselves to the world, our legacy, how we want to be, is probably the most precious thing we have. Gary is 82. He's just celebrated his 60th wedding anniversary with his wife. His son, Jack, I'm friends with all of them now and Andrea. He has an amazing family. I knew they would all watch the film. He's a very intelligent, sharp, still sharp as ever. And knowing that he would watch it and how much I admire him too. I, I was super nervous about that. Um, I, did, I, I did a lot of work because I certainly never wanted to feel that I could have done more, you know? And you got to meet him even before yeah, you no, shot. Yeah, I stayed with him. And he was unbelievably warm yeah. and generous. He met me at the airport. He said, I'll pick you up. <laughs> he was at the so curb crazy. as I came out with the trunk open of the car and he, came to meet me and he shook me by the hand. I'll never forget it. Just let me pause that for a second. Every single one of his campaign team I'd spoken with and every single one of them had given me advice mm-hmm. about how I should be and what's going to happen how the weekend. Like, they were all nervous for me, right? So <laughs> back to the story. He shakes my hand and with the other hand, he put his hand on my cheek. And it felt like about two or three seconds. And there's a look of, it's going to be okay. It's okay. Well. Wow. It was quite paternal and quite beautiful. And we went back to his house. We talked, it was just easy from the beginning. And his uh, wife, Lee, had just had uh, hip surgery. I hope she doesn't mind me saying that. Um, And so they have, their bedroom is upstairs, so they couldn't go upstairs. So they were on the fold-out couch in the, the, like, the office. And I was sleeping in their bed. Oh, my God. Because that was the bed. So I was in Gary's bed. He said, yeah. And wow. I remember him coming. I said, are you sure? He goes, yeah, don't worry. Use the bed. And, and I've cleared some space in my closet. And so there was this gap. Oh, about, my God. So that's all Gary's clothes. I'm hanging up my jacket, my shirt, and his shoes. And I was like, he was unbelievably generous. I mean, and, and, and he makes a mean martini. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Oh, good. Uh, I was talking to Jason earlier, and he said, well, first of all, in addition to giving everyone on the set lottery tickets <laughs> every Friday, which right. I think is amazing. Did anyone ever win big, by the way? Um, a $1,500 win. What? Oh, That's yeah. pretty great. Did you get a cut of it? <laughs> 50%, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, the first American film I was on, uh, X-Men, an Aussie guy, actor, came to visit me. And I was walking around, you know that thing where you really should know someone's name, but you don't, so you just avoid it when you're with someone? And he goes, you don't know that guy's name, do you? And I went, no. He goes, how long have you been on this film? I said, three months. He goes, that's pathetic. <laughs> so pathetic. And I said, it's, a, it's just a little different here. There's a lot of people. He goes, no, there's no excuse. I went, you're right, there's no excuse. And it is a little different than in Australia. In Australia, there's no stand-ins, right? So really? You, no, while they're lighting, you stand there and the crew give you shit for an hour. 
and you just stand there and we'll sit while you hey Billy, how's your week? Yeah, good, man. And like, oh, yes, oh, man. Yeah, this and that, right? It's all of that. And so here's you the stand in. I didn't even know that. that. I did my first rehearsal on X Men, and this guy, remarkably, same height as me, walks up <laughs> and he's chatting with me. And I said to him, I said, Dude, you don't have to talk to me. It's okay. I've got to stand here. He goes, no, I'm standing here. And I said, no, I'm standing here for the lighting. And he goes, no, that's my job. I'm just standing here for the lighting. I was like, well, all right. He goes, dude, you go back to your trailing, you drink your Evian, and then you come out here. <laughs> that's awesome. So I'm three months in. I didn't know the name of this. And I was like, I've got to find a way without appearing like a complete dork of... Making sure at least I get to say hello and yeah. thanks, thanks for your work and how are you and how's the week been? And so I came up with this Aussie tradition of lottery tickets and uh, so I would go around once, I thought uh, at least once a week yeah. and say hi, how are you, thanks for, how are you, have a good weekend, how's it going? And I, found, <laughs> I buried myself because I found in films that if I wasn't scheduled for a Friday, all of a sudden I was scheduled for oh, a Friday. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. But if you think of getting rich, don't buy scratchy tickets. I can tell you that not a lot of people win. The other thing Jason said was that you were such an expert on Gary Hart mm. that everyone from like the costume people to you know the right. the people who uh, were doing script supervising would mm. come to you right. and ask you know, do you to verify things. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit like that. <laughs> well, I wanted to get his voice, so I was listening every day. I would listen to his speeches and stuff that I had. I had about sixty hours of video, so mm. I was just I would listen to different bits, and yes, I read a lot, but. I, I really want to give a, a shout out to uh, Amy, Amy Stevens, who I found through Anne Hathaway. Because when we did um, uh, Les Mis, Anne came in with all this research, these binders that were incredibly useful, and gave them to the director, and the director distributed with all the cast. And uh, of course, there's the book, but just history of what the time or what life was like. And so Amy, I said, "Who? How'd you get this?" Said I used this woman called Amy Stevens. Uh, I hope you don't mind Amy me saying this, but so I've used her ever since. Now, mm. Amy read maybe 37 books on Gary and she found B-roll footage, you know, like, and she was a dramaturg originally for 10 years. So every bit of research is not like, look how much research I've done. Every bit of research is practical stuff that an actor can use. So she gave me five binders this big, about 60 hours, but like she would go to the, new, the, the channel in Des Moines and say, hey, can I get the off cuts of the stuff you didn't use? And so I have a one hour footage, I'll never forget it, of Gary at a political fundraiser doing the walk around shaking hands. It's one hour shot just watching Gary walk around. Now, if you just go to news, you get a three minute thing that someone's edited up. So there was, and there's one bit in that hour where he sits down and it's in 1984 before he's mm -hmm. a deal. No one's talking to him and he's just obviously tired. And he's just sitting there and for a little bit. And then someone comes up, a shoe shine guy and sh shines his shoes and he's like, oh, thanks so much. And he tips him and then he goes back and has a cup of tea, like that kind of stuff. So Amy is really my key. And That's so amazing. people were drawing on all her research and I use her whenever I can. And what was it like when Gary did see them? I, has he seen it yet? He's seen Actually. it, yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, Jason flew to Denver. Um, all of Gary's uh, campaign team all flew from all their different jobs. And they've all gone on to be complete rock stars in their field. And they all flew in and he saw it with Lee and, mm. uh, and his son Jack. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and then they went out for hot chocolate afterwards, I think. Um, he said to me, and I... I'm careful about, because he is very private, I don't mm -hmm. want to give, he probably said some things to me he doesn't want to be public, but I don't think he'd mind this, but he, he was very, very happy with how his wife was portrayed. Yeah. Uh, he often has said to me how Lee is the strongest woman he's ever met. And he just loved the way Vera portrayed. Mm -hmm. the, She's the wonderful. Character. She's incredible, yeah. Um, I have a couple more questions from the audience if we have time. I yeah. know you have to be somewhere. So we have a couple minutes? Sure. Or? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, uh, Henley, mm. I think that's how it's pronounced, has a question for Hugh Michael. Um, <laughs> wants to know uh, did it, a future acting goal for you or any types of roles you'd love to play? Um, I, 
After doing Romeo and Juliet back in college, which we then did a little run of it after we graduated, uh, I haven't done a Shakespeare since. But uh, you asked me what I thought I would end up doing. Yeah. I thought it would be Shakespeare. And I haven't done one yet, so I'd love to do that. Really? No. Um, and if I, I'm being greedy, but I would love to be able to do a movie musical every few years, as, as I told you. And uh, I'm really ready to go back on Broadway. Because I haven't done a musical musical on Broadway for 15 years. I've done my own one-man show, but not that. I'm really ready to do that. And, uh, yeah. Was Steady Rain the last time you were on Broadway? I did The River, Jazz Butterworth played That's The River. That's right, of course, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. So Steady Rain was before that. Steady Rain was 2009 with Daniel and Craig, and then it was The River was in 2014. You know, I was in the audience the night um, the woman's cell phone went off. Oh, right, and you yeah. guys, in character, right. told her to turn off her cell. Right. It was yeah. amazing. <laughs> no, because yeah. you never broke character. No, the play was two, two yeah. pops. 80% of it was to the audience telling their version of the same events, right, which were very different. So it was during one of my monologues, the audience and the phone rang, and I thought, I'm going to let that go. I was in character, <laughs> you know, just in, let that go. And, and you know when it rings and they're like, I'm not going to answer it because no one knows it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going, oh, oh, no, oh, oh, no. And it goes quiet after 20 rings. It was, it was going a on. long time. So then it goes, it stops. And about a minute later, it starts up again. <laughs> and everyone around is like, oh, no, oh, God, oh, no, oh. <laughs> And I was like, well, I'm talking to the audience. It's a bit ridiculous if I don't address yeah. this. Like, clearly half the audience is about to kill whoever's got a cell phone on. <laughs> and I just said, why don't you answer it? You want to answer? Answer it. Answer it. And it was right at the end of the thing yeah. where I'm in this impassioned and this and angry and this. Answer your phone. Like, and this whole thing blew up in Australia. Jackman loses his shit. <laughs> For the audience. And I was like, no, 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 it was the character. I was the character. But and he anyway. wasn't, it wasn't even that. No. That's so interesting. And ironically, my wife is usually the one with the phone <gasps> ring. No. No, just because she's super, super forgetful. And and she's like, oh, sorry, sorry. Like, <laughs> so I, I do actually have patience for people who do it. No one does not. It always no, happens after happens. interval. It's now hardly ever at the beginning. It's usually after interval. Because people go back and turn it on. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, and finally, I just kind of want to know, I mean, you've conquered Broadway and film and you can sing, you can dance. Can you please tell us something you're bad at so that we can just feel a little bit better about ourselves? Do not ask me to come and fix anything in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just talking like computers or so, I'm talking light bulbs. <laughs> Like, you know, if someone comes around, you know, the drip, and I go, you, f you fix that? Like, yeah, I fix it. That's amazing. I do. It's a washer. You just put a washer. No, that's incredible. Like, <laughs> my dad could do it. He was terrible uh, at that, and I'm terrible. No, yeah, I'm the worst handyman around. So oh. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, so, thank you. That was. Thank you guys so much for being a great audience. Thank you, thank you so thank much you for so being much. here. <laughs> You got me really teary. <laughs> Sorry. Got you singing. <laughs> Thank you. I could, Thanks, I could guys. see you Thank over you. there. I was like. <laughs> oh shit! They didn't tell me that. Oh, I'm so sorry. What's that? No, we're good.